It's time to play overrated or underrated web tech, where the three of us web devs will pick a topic and then just say whether or not we think it's overrated or underrated. So grab yourself some snacks and uh, play along. Yes, let's do it. First up, is it overrated or underrated? Server components in React and Next.js. I think they are equally rated because I, th I think a lot it. of people... <laughs> yes, well, okay. Can I not be... Be Switzerland? The answer is um, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna say they're they're slightly underrated and slightly misunderstood because mm. of the initial introduction to them was sort of forced upon people in yeah. Next.js. But I think a lot of people don't realize the the benefits of streaming, the benefits of being able to render entirely on the server without having to bring a whole bunch of JavaScript the benefits of being able to render dynamic components on demand, which is kind of cool in like the, the AI space. I'm going to say they are overrated, specifically because I think server-side rendering currently is being overrated. No way. Uh, I think there's a massive amount of sites that do not need server-side rendering. That said, you know, server-side rendering when used as it should or whatever, it's obviously important. But man, why, why am I doing all that compute on the server when I could be doing that compute on the the client side, and you know, yeah, yeah. pay yeah. let let the users pay for the compute. That's exactly <laughs> correct. Yes, yeah. that is exactly correct. Especially when you don't need the server side rendering. Uh, what benefit is it really giving you beyond um, increasing your serverless web bill? Yeah, I completely agree. It's overrated. And uh, roast me in the comments if you if you disagree. But like, I, I think like Wes has none of the points that Wes said are wrong. Like, it's totally. a good, it's a good tech. They're like great ideas. But I think the idea of server components first is absolutely overrated. Like it, so many people that are picking up Next.js uh, and using like the latest app router are being forced to, and maybe not forced, right? it's like they don't realize or, or even understand that, that, that that's how they're building websites first. Instead of making the decision and thinking about, well, should this be server rendered or, sh or should this be client rendered? It's kind of like pushing everything off to the, the framework to decide. I think that people think that client components are bad now that we have server components. Right. And even Next.js yeah. has it in their docs. They say, there's nothing wrong with a client component because <laughs> everyone's just trying to figure out, well, how do I do this without using a client component? And the answer is no, you use, it's fine to do it on the client. Word. So I think Astro is doing cool stuff. Yeah, they are. And they, they also have like RPC now as well. So if you yeah. want like a, a server function that runs when you submit a thing, Astro is doing really cool stuff. Word. All right. Next one we have uh, overrated or underrated CSS in JS solutions. So we're talking about uh, what are the style components is probably the big one. We've got Panda CSS is, is probably another big one. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say that any of these options today are overrated if you're rating them at, at all. I know a lot of people still use this stuff. For me personally, I think CSS has evolved or the systems around CSS have evolved to the point where you can solve the problems that these things are solving without having to reach for a JavaScript solution. For me personally, I, I don't feel like JavaScript is the right solution here because at the end of the day, when, when you get down to it, the only thing that this is really solving is scoping. And there are other solutions for that these days beyond um, having to bring in a potential JavaScript runtime or a build time thing that who knows, you're mm -hmm. now introducing Babel or whatever into your code base if you didn't already have it. You're potentially having to write CSS and JavaScript objects, which makes it totally non-portable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also so, hate doing that. Yes. CSS and JS, to me, it solved a problem at the time in a way that nothing else did. That time is gone. I'm, I'm over it. Yeah. Yeah. I disagree. I think it's underrated. I think... Like, let's say you're in a template file. How do I, can I go to definition on a CSS class name? Yes. Right? Can I hover over it and, and see like the, the preview of it? I don't want to context switch to other files, or maybe there's like global CSS that I don't know is applying to this specific element. So you have to kind of have all of that in your head. I think this is, this is honestly one of the issues I have with the, the syntax FM code base. It's like there's global styles and I have mm. no idea where they're defined or like why they're affecting my elements. So with something like a CSS in, in JS solution, it's like highly scoped, right? I think we're using Svelte. So technically, if we just stuck to like the scope styles, that would help too. But, yeah, but um, global, I mean, you can't abandon global CSS entirely because, you know, the nature of CSS is that you apply kind of like a blanket layer globally and then each component then gets 
its own. I mean, Tailwind is, yeah. is a big thing of that, where the styles are essentially global and you're applying these classes. So the most important thing to me in a global CSS file is what are the what what them bars look like, you know? Yeah, yeah. those those global variables. I think it's a little bit overrated because we don't necessarily need a lot of the solutions. I think on bigger teams, one of the major use cases for CSS in JS, especially a lot of the, the newer ones are, are zero runtime, meaning yeah. that you're not calculating your CSS on every single render, you're doing it at, at, at build time, which Svelte also does as well. Yeah. We appreciate you being wrong, CJ. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> just, yeah just joking. <laughs> Question number three, overrated or underrated web components? I think personally, I'm just going to jump in here. I feel like they're very underrated, um, not authoring them necessarily because I don't want to author them. I, I think they're underrated to use them. Shoelace is so full featured and now Web Awesome is so full featured. The amount of like little widgets you have in there are it's it's so wonderful. You have these UI utility libraries that are fantastic. All of these pre-made, lovely looking components. But there's so much that comes along with those that with something like a web component library doing the same thing, you're getting to avoid a lot of that and you're bringing along stuff that is the platform. And uh, I, I like that quite a bit. Yeah, I'm a big fan of web components as well. For the longest time, I never really understood it. And I, I don't also think I particularly like the authoring experience of them, but Same. holy hell, I'll use them all day long, right? Like I just uh, used Media Chrome the other day, which is Mux's web component one. I don't love that they're like global. So you just have to like assume that they're in the air somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and and then like the, the TypeScript story on them is a little bit tricky as well, trying to merge the types. But I absolutely love using them in the fact that we can have these people build reusable web components, like Scott said, and we can use them in any framework is awesome. Yeah. yeah, I agree they're underrated. I think a lot of the chatter online and a lot of like the debates that have popped up is when people try to use them maybe for bigger projects. Like I think probably the one of the some of the best use cases for web components are framework authors or people shipping code that's going to exist on other people's websites mm -hmm. uh, because it uses less code. There's not there's not a whole framework that you have to ship with it. Yeah, I think they're underrated. I think more people that build stuff that go on other people's websites should be using web components. Like Sentry is an example of that. Like if you're I don't, they don't necessarily use web components, but if they were to add a UI or something like that, it's shipping to thousands and thousands of websites. It should be as small as possible. It shouldn't have all of this extra bloat of like framework and, and everything else. Word. Yeah, totally. You know what's not overrated is tracking your errors and exceptions, solving your bugs and making <laughs> your applications genuinely better and faster, stronger, all of those things. And you can do that with Sentry at Sentry.io. Head on over to century.io forward slash syntax sign in and get two months for free with the coupon code tasty treat, all lowercase, all one word. Uh, Century is the best, man. We use it to fix and solve all of our problems, speed up our website, and so much more. And let me tell you, they're always cranking on new features, so check it out. All right. The last one we have today is overrated or underrated static site generators. Who wants to pick this one up first? Oh, man. I'll, I'll talk about this one because I just moved my aging website off of Gatsby. And I absolutely love being able to statically generate pages, but not at the expense of not being able to do other things. Um, and, and that's kind of why I like a lot of these modern frameworks is you should be able to client render, server render, static generate on a page level, or, or maybe even at a, at a mm -hmm. component level at, at some point, because the limitation of making absolutely your entire website statically generated is as soon as you want to do something dynamic, you're stuck. It's nice to be able to say, OK, well, this stuff can be static or this stuff can be static for not even static, but just can be cached for uh, six months or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I do want to opt in, to server running when I do want to make things dynamic, when I need a little sip of backend. That's what I always say is like, mm -hmm. I just need a sip of backend and you shouldn't have to be so disruptive when you need a little bit of backend. Yeah, I think they're underrated too. I think I think a lot of like, how do I say this? Like, a lot of sites are built with React that probably shouldn't have been built with React or probably didn't need a front end framework. And some of these modern tools like Astro for building static sites give you that same dev experience, but the resulting bundle is just static files. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of sites that have JavaScript on them or that were written with React that don't necessarily need to be. So people should be reaching for static site generators more. Yeah, I think the answer here, like Wes indicated, is pre-rendering. Uh, I do think that pre-rendering is probably underrated and maybe static generation is overrated as much as I actually, I mean, I think static generation is great. I, I think there's a lot to be gained by recognizing uh, what should just be a regular ass old HTML page, right? Yeah. And um, you can just write that in regular HTML. But yeah, I, I, I think static site generators are a net benefit because you do, you get the benefits of authoring experience of some of these frameworks, but in, Mm -hmm. You know, you, the user doesn't always need that stuff. The user doesn't need to ship all that stuff. All right, that's it for today. If you want to watch us talk about more web dev trivia, we've got a link on one of my hands here. Uh, we talk about how much data does Facebook use every single day? What's the most expensive domain ever uh, done? Some really fun trivia. Uh, it was it was fun, so certainly check it out. Yeah, and we're trying to get to 500,000 uh, YouTube subs. <laughs> so uh, there was a comment on a recent video if we get to 500K, we're all going to switch to NeoVim for a month. So subscribe. <laughs>